So Michael, talk to us a little bit about theater in general, being in a play, directing a play, kind of uh, what it means to you. Acting in a play is very different than directing a play. And it's very different than teaching as well, and all three things I love. I love serving a play as an actor. I don't have to think about anything but my personal journey. It's not my job to scope out the arc of the play or to um, figure out what the audience is trying to get or uh, what you hope they get. Um, it's just to enter the world of the play as truthfully, authentically, and honestly as I possibly can and to be in relationship with the other person or people that I'm in a scene with and feed off the given uh, uh, circumstances and uh, what I know of the human condition. The experience of acting in a play, of playing a character in a predicament perhaps unlike anything you've ever experienced, enlarges your understanding of what it means to be human. The research tells us that the human brain makes no distinction between read about experience and lived experience, that the same parts of the brain light up. So imagine then the almost absolute affinity an actor might feel about his or her acted experience. It's as real as it gets, if the actor is willing to go there. And this acted experience, every bit as visceral and vivid as real life, done repeatedly, I might add, gives us a stronger connection to other people. I don't need to lose a child in real life, thank you very much. But I do need to lose a child in a play to experience that horror. Somehow that brings me closer to understanding and empathizing with the suffering of my fellow human beings. It's deep inner work that actors do. Not to mention that it's a whole hell of a lot of fun. I know good acting is infinitely more than pretending. But ultimately, it is a kind of play. It's all play. Places, places, places. We auditioned for this wild and wondrous thing, got cast into roles, Montagues, Capulets, citizens, a holy man, and a prince. Young actors playing young characters, adults playing adults, a bold undertaking of community theater. We read clumsily through a script, got schooled on Shakespeare, began blocking with scripts out of our hands, and we put this thing together on a stage that spun like a globe. It was difficult, exhausting work. Who the hell am I? What do I want? What moves me forward? How do you say these words again? And in what order? Must I accent every I am big foot? Am I dancing or am I not dancing? Romeo has 615 lines. What could go wrong? Rehearsals flew by a couple of months in a blink. And there we were, before the curtains, opening night, curtains. 
in the very best possible light. It's transformative. I think when you're really living in that language, mm -hmm. you lose yourself right. in, in the best of ways right. as an actor. I agree. And that's what I love. I think people, young actors and, and green actors, as well as seasoned actors, think they know what it means. And the truth is they don't. We don't. We don't. I include myself in this. And it is my job as an actor to dive deeper and deeper and deeper into that. And indeed, it's my job as a director to force actors to go deeper and deeper and deeper into that. In a lot of ways, I call it necessary monotony because it feels monotonous. Mm -hmm. Dissecting each word, each idea, each image. But then when you put it all together, if you've done that work, you put it all together and it feels effortless and it's mm -hmm. so rich and textured mm -hmm. and full. Poem from Director's Notes from Michael Mendelssohn. Move the language forward. Move the language. Lift the language. To whom are you talking? There are only three possibilities, the earth, the gods, or another human being. If it happens to be a human being, ask yourself, how do I feel about the person I am with? Breathe volume and diction. If you can't hear your voice bouncing off the back wall, you're not loud enough. Make an investment. Know where you are going and from where you are coming. In Act 3, Scene 1, how do you feel about the heat? Whatever is going on for you, let that be amplified. Don't let your mouth get ahead of your mind. Make sure your brain, your body, and your mouth are working together. Use the words to create emotion and not the other way around. Exit more like cheetahs and less like rhinos. Juliet, I want you to stab yourself three times. Romeo, Romeo, there is no response. Finally, don't play the end before the end. This is a corrupt world, and everyone here is a survivor. I think for me the most difficult scene was the dance scene. Uh, one five. Mm -hmm. It's such a contemporary scene. The, it, it's this, it's, it's like, all of these, it's like this film that there's this little scene happens and this little scene happens and there's this big dance going on and we have to somehow throw focus but there's this dance going on mm -hmm. and people have to step out of it and into it and then all of a sudden there's this surreal moment when Romeo and Juliet see each other for that, that first time and, and touch and dance, or they, they don't dance, they just stand there. And all I wanted to make sure ultimately was that we were telling the story and the story is the story is really only told in the side moment, the side little conversations, and and and, and Romeo and Juliet's uh, uh, moments. Um, and so I hope that people got that. It's time. You know it. At some point in your life, you have been in the right place at the right time. People like to say about stuff that happens to them, especially the big stuff, good or bad, that everything happens for a reason. That's bull. As Shakespeare knew. His characters, you know, talk about the fates and the sun and the moon and the blessed stars, but Shakespeare knew better. You're in the right place at the right time, and you fall hard. Your choices in love or in hate have their own trajectory, drawing inexorably to a close. Love at first sight? Been there, done that. And why not, if you're in the right place? 
and it's time. I'll, I'll try to see if I can remedy this, but make sure that it's only about here, okay? You know what I mean? It's getting to the post Yeah. Um, yeah, let's try it. And good, yeah, just keep coming. During Act Two, Capulet writes a poem. I know what's coming. It's happened before, as if in a loop, in exactly the same way each time, and it never ends well. But I'm always surprised. The shouting in the streets, the alarm, the subsequent chaos, my wife charging into the fray, screaming bloody murder over the death of nephew Tibble. And I'm like, what the hell? Not again. The prince demands an explanation, and Benvolio gives it to him in spades. He goes on and on and on, defending that little Montague shit. And I stand there, for once, speechless. No words. Mercutio and Tybalt are dead, and Romeo is banished. Here I am, again, picking up the pieces. Things have fallen out, sir, so unluckily indeed. Okay, so now let's talk about Act 3, Scene 5. Mm -hmm. What are the difficulties of that scene in particular? Just looking at it from your perspective, both as a director and an actor, well, I think it's the scene that Juliet has to experience the largest emotional hurricane. And she has to go from elation and joy and complete openness and love to this place of... She takes a very dark journey in, in this scene to a place of defiance and anger and resentment. And it doesn't stop for her, and I and I actually think it's the, it's 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 the scene in which she consciously lies to her family for the first time in her life and defies her family. It's a moment when she she steps into this other person. It's the scene where she she has to become someone else to survive the rest of the play. Um, she becomes manipulative. She learns all of those things that take away her innocence in that scene. And it's very like, emotional to think <laughs> about. It's it's a hard journey for her. That said, I think it's a hard journey for the entire Capulet household. Capulet speaks of his daughter's grief. When the sun sets, I see the drizzled dew envelop the grass like a blanket over the sleeping earth. It's spring. I'm feeling truly a bit grizzled. Grief weighs her down, my daughter Juliet, like a blanket, the sun having set on my brother's king, his beloved son. Grass grows on graves, leaves of grass, and as sun is still setting, the dark blankets all, my mind, it depraves. Strength. 
strength shall help afford. Farewell, dear father. I hold her body in my arms, dead and not dead, my child and not my child. I am Lord Capulet and Kate is Juliet. In life, we are virtual strangers, but on stage, I hold her in my arms and under the hot stage lights, I weep for her death or close to it. I don't know what killed her, I don't even ask. I simply speak of her settled blood and her stiffened joints and the ice of her skin. And even while I speak, I talk of not being able to speak. Death has tied up my tongue. I don't know she's not really dead but only sleeping. I am, as they say, in the dark. And I remain there in darkness until the end of Act 5 when my child, who is not my child, dies a second time, this time for real. I lose this stranger daughter twice every night, and every night when I walk off stage for the last time, I have to work really hard not to lose it, to remind myself that I am in the play, that this young girl is not really my daughter, and that when the lights come back up, experience together the final curtain call and that's not a metaphor and everyone involved appreciated what an extraordinary experience it was because it certainly was for me and I hope they they take with them how much work has to be done to just make something happen right and, and I and I always think you, it, it always takes more work than we think it does mm-hmm. and we think it will and I think some of the kids were it was like a brick hitting them in the face when we, we got up on our feet and they realized how much work they still had to do. You know, they've asked to do Shakespeare again next year. Did they? <laughs> I love that. What are we doing? <laughs>